Good morning, Green Street. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's it's been a wonderful weekend. So yes, we were. I'm not even supposed to have been here today. Yesterday we were supposed to be in Webster City doing a, a wedding for my daughter and one of the uh, actually my now son-in-law's mom test, and her fiance tested positive for COVID-19. So we did a Zoom wedding yesterday afternoon. If that isn't different. But that just goes to uh, the awesomeness that our God is, that he makes things possible in all situations. So whether you're here with us in person or whether you are online joining us, welcome to Grace Street this morning. This morning, our call to worship comes from Luke chapter 12, verse 8. It says, I tell you the truth, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. If we acknowledge him here, he will acknowledge us. What I found interesting, and I told Mark this this morning, is when I go back to what my uh, posted verse of the day today was online, it says this from Jeremiah. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, or in some translations that you might be used to, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will acknowledge God as our uh, as our God and Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Now that just sends this, this tingling through my body as I think about that, how wonderful it is that no matter what happens here, the world may beat us up. People can, can kill us even, but here's the good news. We will be with Jesus in the end. Now, Mark's message today is the, about the gifts of witness, and I haven't read it, so I can't give any of it away. I wanted to hear it straight from Mark, because I know God's ha had him reworking it, even last night, as he admitted to me this morning. But isn't that awesome? God is going to give us the tools today to share our faith with others through the spirits of the gifts of the Spirit that we've been talking about now for uh, the last several weeks. Thank you, Father, for this amazing gift that you've given us. Thank you for the message that you've given to Pastor Mark to give today. Father God, we just thank you that if we do acknowledge you, that if we do accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that you will acknowledge us when we return home to you in heaven. And as Jeremiah said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us, as a church, be willing to serve the Lord, Father. Let us be willing to serve you. And as, as we prepare to move forward, Father, we have so many things that we have, that we have wanted to plan. And, and now we've got a, a movie night on, on, in the works. And, and back together Sunday, Father, in the works. And what we, our prayer is, is that the people of Grace Street will rise up. And they will come and they will say, how can we serve? Father, teach us how to serve. Teach us how to witness through everything that we do and say. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, hey, I want to start off this morning by thanking you for the prayers and everything. And, and uh, after my tumble on Thursday and taking some skin and some pride along with it, uh, I'm starting to feel better. The pain level is actually dropping down a little bit today, so um, it's not too bad. But if you kind of see me moving back and forth. It just hurts to stand in place for too long. So, 
Well, today uh, we're in week eight of our eight-part series of the Gifts of the Holiness, and we, uh, we really have covered a lot of ground uh, in those eight weeks, in these eight different sessions in here. And it's been kind of interesting because we did a little bit of reverse on a Wednesday night for our study night in here. We have a lot of great discussion that goes on in here, a lot of different points of view just outside of just listen to me yak for a while. But uh, we have a lot of different things that people bring up and different points of view that we can share with one another so we can kind of lift each other up in that message as well. And so today I thought it was really interesting um, as we're preparing for our Back to Church Sunday on September 20th coming up that we have the blessings in here of spiritual gifts in witness. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. So I picked this verse in Luke today, Luke 12, 8. And it says that, I tell you the truth, everyone who acknowledged me public here on earth, the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. Now, that is a promise in itself. Because if you think about it, and you're listening to what is actually being said here, it doesn't say, if you're going to get there, and it doesn't say, just those who I choose, but it says, everyone who acknowledges me here publicly on earth, the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. Wow, what a promise. That is really something to look forward to. If we accept Christ into our hearts, we know that he is going to be there for us in front of God and the angels. What a great promise to look forward to. And it's something that should really, really lift us up and understand how we could witness in that, because that's truly what it's talking about. If we acknowledge publicly on earth the presence of Christ, and what he means to us. If we witness to others what that means to us, he will witness for us to the angels. What a spokesman. Wow, we really have something to look forward to. So I kind of want to start off today and, and talk about a few things, but have you ever had something good happen to you, but you were really kind of afraid to tell anybody about it? You know? had something really, really special, but eh, I don't know. What if you found this big bag of money or valuables or, or jewels? Would you rush right out and tell somebody about it? Or are you more apt to kind of keep it under wraps because, you know, somebody might want to lay claim to that? And I think many of us would need to ponder on that one for quite a while before we made the decision. So let's look back today. I want, I want to start back, and if, for those of you who have your Bibles with you, go to 2 Kings 7, and we're going to take a look starting at verse 3 and going through verse 11. 2 Kings 3 through 11. Or, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 7, 3 through 11. And it talks about lepers in here visiting an enemy camp. Now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. Why should we be sitting here waiting to die, they asked each other. Will we starve if we stay here? See, there was a famine going on in the city. We will starve if we go back there. So we might as well go out and surrender to the Aramean army if they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. So at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Arameans. But when they came to the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and the galloping of horses and the sound of a great army approaching. King of Israel has hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to attack us, they cried to one another. So they panicked, and they ran off into the night, abandoning their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, 
and everything else as they fled for their lives. So when the lepers arrived at the edge of the camp, they went into one tent after another, eating and drinking wine, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and hid it. And finally they said to each other, well, this is not right. This is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. If we wait until morning, some calamity will certainly fall upon us. Come on, let's go back and tell the people at the palace. So here we go. They had something really, really special happen. And they had all this stuff. And see, back in those days, you know, if you were a leper, you were cast out of society. And you were left to die at the gates just simply depending upon the gratuity of others to survive each and every day. So they went back to the city and told the gatekeepers what had happened. We went out to the Aramean camp, they said, and no one was there. The horses and donkeys were tethered and the tents were all in order, but there wasn't a single person around. Then the gatekeeper shouted the news to the people in the palace. Wow. So here they found this thing, and it was a really, really, really good thing. And at first they wanted to keep it to themselves because they were cast out and they had nothing. They had to survive on the gratuity of others, sending them out scraps of food here and there. And according to the law, people with leprosy, see, they weren't allowed to be in the city, but they had to depend on that charity outside the gates. And we find that in Leviticus 13. And it says in Leviticus 13 that they had to tear up their clothes and they had to leave their hair all disheveled. Yeah, it wouldn't work for me. But they had to leave their hair all disheveled so people could see at a distance that they were unclean that they were not accepted as part of the community any longer, that they were cast out from society. Can you imagine what those people felt like? Can you imagine what it was to try and simply survive day to day saying, where's my next meal gonna come from? And then here they are, they're, they're gonna surrender to an opposing army. And they figured, hey, if they kill us, we're no worse off than what we are because we're surely going to starve to death outside the gates to the city where all the wild animals are without any protection. And instead, God gave them this opportunity. And he went in and he chased off the Aramean army and left all of the spoils so that the people, God's people, who believed in him that were inside those city walls could receive that blessing of food because they were starving. And they got the animals. So these lepers who were marginalized by society, cast out and left outside, and because of the famine and the presence of that Aramean army, their situation was desperate. Those four lepers found and discovered that deserted camp and realized that their lives had been spared by God. And at first, they kept that good news to themselves, forgetting their fellow citizens who were starving in the city. Then they came to realize, as it says in the scripture in there, and I think that is a really a key phrase that we need to think about. It says in the scripture, they came to realize that keeping the good news to themselves was wrong. And they set out in the dead of night to make it right. God had given them a huge gift and it wasn't right not to share it. So I have a couple of video clips here that we'll get to in just a second here. But I want you to see, if you can't see, it says, be a witness for the Lord. The most loving act you can ever do for someone 
is to share the gospel with them. And see, the word gospel translates into good news. Good news. So when we take a look at this, it follows the same exact scripture that we're reading in 2 Kings where it said that they set out, they came to realize that keeping the good news to themselves was wrong. So they set out in the dead of night. So what do we think about? If we read the rest of the, the, the Bible, throughout the Bible, throughout history, and it, it talked about how they were, you know, not to travel at night because it wasn't safe between the wild animals and the thieves that would rob them. But they set out in the dead of night, these casts outs from society, these marginalized people, so that the people within the city could share in that good news. So I've got a couple of video clips this morning, and I kind of want to preface this by saying it, it's kind of a precursor to our September 20th Back to Church Sunday. But I want you to watch these and uh, see if this kind of speaks to you as well. Pretty good example of what not to do. What not to do. So how not to invite. And maybe this will open your eyes, this next one in here, to maybe a little more friendly approach. Maybe not what you had suspected first. The old saying goes, don't judge a book by its cover. And it's true. Don't look at that person who ends up next to you and say, that person is way too different from me. I could not invite him to my church. I can't have my friends see me bring this guy in. We need to see others as Christ sees them, with a holy compassion for the lost. You know what? We all need God, no matter what the person looks like, or how different they are from you. As Christians, we are responsible to reach out to those around us, their eternity depends on it. We need to stop worrying about the opinions of others. We need to open our eyes. New opportunities are put in front of us every single day to come out of our comfort zone, open our mouths, and speak these simple words. Hey man, if you're not doing anything this weekend, uh, check this out, we're doing something cool at our church. <laughs> A much more likable approach, I'd say, to uh, inviting someone to share in the good news. So the good news about Jesus Christ must be shared too. We had, we had that great news from the lepers, and they went back, even though they were cast out and marginalized by the people within the walls of the city. They found something, something very, very good 
and they shared that good news even with people who would maybe have been viewed as their enemies. So the good news about Jesus Christ must be shared too. See, because no news is more important than that good news. No news, that good news about Christ, nothing is more important than that. And we have to understand that people are actually literally dying from not having that news. They are dead in their sin. And if they pass on without ever hearing that good news, then we as Christians have not done what we are supposed to do. So we can't become too preoccupied with our own faith that we neglect to share that faith with others. We can't be too preoccupied with our own faith not to share that faith, that good news, with others. See, our good news, like that of lepers, won't wait until morning. No one knows the time or the date when Christ will return again. So if we're kind of putting it off, because we're just not really all that comfortable with talking to somebody about it, then what happens if it becomes too late? Well, did you notice whatever happened in this story and what, what's going on in here when they said that they came to realize? Now, how do you think that happened? They just came to realize what they were doing was wrong and that that good news needed to be shared. Well, see, that's the urging of that Holy Spirit. That gift of witness came upon them. It didn't come out like a big voice coming down from heaven saying, now is the time to go. But it was an urging from within. The urging of the Holy Spirit to do something for their fellow man to do something for the com community, even though that community had cast them out. See, that was that Holy Spirit working within them for the betterment of the community, that spiritual gift. That Holy Spirit urging them to tell the good news, witnessing to others of God's great fortune and goodwill. So witnessing, what is it? So one of the things, if you, if you look in my Bible concordance in there, uh, when I was doing my research for my sermon today, is, is I looked in there and, and I looked under testimony and it says, see witness. And so you, you kind of take a look at that and you go, okay, well, it could be my story told to someone else. And that's a certain form of witness. And we could use a, a really neat analogy of witnessing where witnessing can take on very, very many forms. It's being a good listener to someone who has a problem. It's showing good works to someone in need. It can be speaking to a group or participating in something like the walk to Emmaus. And I like to kind of say it this way is Witness to everyone at all times, and in that, if necessary, use words. Witness to everyone at all times, and if necessary, use words. That means by our actions, people can know that there's something more, that there's something special, and it would want to draw them in to find out more. How come you don't get mad like everybody else? We talked about that last week when we were talking about that spiritual gift in the workplace. It might be just that somebody needs an ear. Somebody needs, has an issue, a problem, and it always helps them out to be able to share it with someone else and lighten that burden a bit. So witnessing to someone doesn't mean you have to sit there and testify to them. It just means that you have to be there for them, 
lift them up and show them that there's something more. It's really important for us to understand that people see our behavior and our character and it speaks about who we are as Christians without having to say a single word. When we do communicate verbally, it can either support their perceptions of who we are and what we stand for, or it could just do the opposite. And it could show as a contradiction to what they believe a Christian should be. So by our actions, by our works, by our deeds, It'll speak volumes to other people on how they see us as Christians living out our lives without us saying a single word. But then when we do say something, are we saying something that contradicts what we stand for? We see examples of purported Christians who stand and proclaim the gospel with their lips and then tell a completely different story by their actions. And it seems to go to undermine that whole story of our faith, our truth, and our honesty. And instead, it sets an example out to those people of really, truly blatant hypocrisy. See, we got to be vigilant with those words that we use, but we have to be even more vigilant of our actions every day. And who those people see, our character is that outward example of what we have inside. Our character is that outward example of what we have inside. So we as Christians in our world today, we have to overcome those false teachings of the word and their examples of do what I say and not as I do. And we've seen many, many times, and we were talking about this Wednesday night, about the fallen TV evangelists from years ago who would get up and spout the good news. I, I wouldn't even say preach the good news because it has to come from your heart if you're preaching. You have to believe in what you're saying when you preach because people will see if you're disingenuous and then they'll question what you say and what you believe. And see, that was the downfall of all these TV evangelists is they were living one life in front of the public view and living a separate life outside of it. And unfortunately, we as Christians, we have to overcome that stereotypical uh, problem of that hypocrisy, even today. People always remember the bad more than they remember the good. And so as Christians, we have to overcome those things. Do as they say, not as I do. And in our video clips today, we saw two different examples of the right way and the wrong way to approach someone to invite them to know what you've learned as Christians. When we are gifted with the grace of the gifts to be able to witness in word to others, we can feel that boldness come on to reach out to others. But see, it has to be done with humbleness and discretion, not with demonstrative actions and being obnoxious. Yeah. <laughs> these poor plants. I'm glad, I'm glad these plants are, pra are plastic and I'm not destroying them, but those of you who know, they, they separate themselves away from me from about four feet on each side when I'm teaching on Wednesdays as well. So, But we have to remember that humbleness and discretion. That should drive every one of our actions. And if we remember back to my very, very first week as I was giving you the sermon on spiritual gifts, that was one of the things that we were talking about then was that humbleness of spirit. We have to approach those people with empathy for the position that they're in, not come in and just slam it in there. Never being judgmental, getting that plate of brownies to bring them. Oh, by the way, they're all color-coded depending upon the sins that you did. I, when I was looking at that and I found that video, it just screamed at me and I said, I gotta share this. But being judgmental and coming off as the old term that they used to use, Bible thumpers coming in, I know you're a sinner, I know what you've done wrong, 
So you're judging them exactly what it tells us not to do in the scriptures. And it's not for us to judge. It's for us to go in and edify these people and lift them up out of the position that they're in. To help them out, to show them that there is a better way. That there is more to life. That there is a life fulfilled in Christ. That's what we're there to do. Not judge them where they sit. So when we look at the scripture today, and I'm, I'm going to go through Acts 2, so those of you with your Bibles handy, Acts 2, 1 through 21, it speaks of Peter witnessing to the crowd, speaking boldly and unafraid. It clearly shows the power of the Holy Spirit working within him. And if you contrast that to the night that Christ was given up, when he was filled with fear, and he was afraid to be associated with Christ that night. And so what happened? He denied him three times. He denied him. And yet, when we look here at Acts, and we look at that day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon Peter, when God anointed him with the ability to witness to others, that gift of witness, he spoke boldly and unafraid. So I want you to keep that in mind as we take a look at that. And this is entitled, The Holy Spirit Comes, if you're looking in your Bible, Bible references. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. So what just happened there? What just happened there? But see, that, this is both a validation and a fulfillment of John the Baptist's words about the Holy Spirit baptizing with fire. We find that in Luke 3.16. And of the prophet Joel and his words about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Why tongues of fire? Well, tongues symbolize speech and communication of the good news. And fire symbolizes God's purifying presence, which burns away all the undesirable elements of our lives and sets our hearts on fire to ignite the lives of others. To ignite the lives of others. I remember when I first gave my life to Christ and I had this warmth, this whole feeling that just enveloped me. And my heart was set on fire. And I really, truly wanted to go out and share that good news. But I didn't do it because I was afraid. I kept it bottled up inside me for quite a while. And I didn't share that with anyone. And then it happened again. This time it was kind of like a Slap upside the head. I got the message that time. But see that burning inside of you. That message, that urging from the Holy Spirit. We need to answer that call. On Mount Sinai, God confirmed the validity of the Old Testament law with fire from heaven. We find that in Exodus 19. And at Pentecost... God confirmed the validity of the Holy Spirit's ministry by sending fire once more. At Mount Sinai, that fire came down on one place in that Pentecost. It came down on many now believers. And it was symbolizing that God's presence is now available to all who believe in him. To all who believe in him. God made his presence known for this group of believers in a very spectacular way. Roaring wind and fire and the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what it was like to be in that crowd that day? It had to be spectacular. It had to be moving. It had to be life-changing. Life-changing. Would God like to reveal himself to you such recognizable ways. 
He may do so, but be wary of forcing your expectations of God. In 1 Kings 19, 10 through 13, Elijah also needed a message from God. First came a great wind, then an earthquake, and finally a fire, but God's message came instead in a gentle whisper to these people. God may use dramatic methods of work in your life, or he may just speak in gentle whispers. Wait patiently and listen always. Wait patiently, listen always. So our scripture continues on with the presence of the Holy Spirit being present. And it says in there that everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee. And yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas around Lib Libya, around Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about how wonderful things that God has done. And they stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They ask each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, ah, oh, they're just drunk. That's all. See, it's interesting to note in here, if we take a look at it, that those persons from Galilee were also known in their culture and in society as being very uncultured people. And they spoke with a particular twang in their voices. Kind of reminds us today of that southern accent and the stereotypical response in your mind going, well, you know, these guys might not all be there. And that's kind of what they were doing. They were marginalizing these Galileans, but they were speaking boldly. They were speaking with authority. And it has such an impact. These persons who normally were marginalized in society, oh, they're just a bunch of fishermen, now are proclaiming the good news of God to thousands of people. So this can be a telling statement if we think about it, because they weren't considered to be the upper end of society and could have been discounted because of who they were. But God uses those people regardless of what their social standing might be. Regardless of who they are or what their voice might sound like. These people literally spoke in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. And it was a miraculous attention getter for the international crowd that was gathered in town for the festival that was going on. God's timing was great because he knew people were here from all over the region, from so many different countries. And they were all gathered together in one place, and they were all able to hear and witness the movement of God through the Holy Spirit, and they heard the good news proclaimed. All of the nationalities represented they recognized their own languages being spoken. More than just the miraculous speaking, it drew their people's attention. They saw and felt that presence of the Holy Spirit. The apostles continued to minister in the Holy Spirit's power wherever they went. So our scripture in Acts continues on with Peter preaching out to that crowd. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. 
It's nine o'clock in the morning. It is too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day that the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you remember back three weeks ago when I had my other uh, sermon in here, we were talking about prophesying. And everybody thinks, well, prophesying is, you know, these fortune-telling things. But really, prophesying is reaching out to others with boldness and with authority and teaching good news. Teaching good news. In the Greek, that's another term for prophesying. So when we see this translated, people are saying, oh, well, this is fortune-telling going on. But that's not it. Because if you notice what it follows up with, your old men will dream dreams, but your people will prophesy. They'll speak out this good news to this international crowd. They'll take it back home and spread the good news of Jesus Christ throughout many, many, many regions to many people. And many people will be saved, witnessing across the nations. So now this was quite a departure from what you would have grown up uh, as a Jew in those days because non-Jews were considered unclean and you didn't want to consort with them in any way, shape, or form if you wanted to conform to the law. But see what happened in here? Did you listen to the words that were given in here? So here God changes all that with the Holy Spirit coming down on them all, Jew and Gentile alike, lighting a fire within those present so they would be redeemed. Redeemed, no matter who they were. No differentiation on race, creed, color, background. They were all children of God. And for the first time, they were all equal in giftedness. See, those barriers of Jews and Gentiles, those who were clean and unclean, were decimated at Pentecost. Decimated. God did away with all that because he sent his spirit down on all present, all races, all creeds, all colors. No differentiation. See, God is colorblind. He doesn't care because we are all children of God. What a powerful message Peter had delivered to those people. Here he was, the one who denied Jesus, and yet was the one whom Jesus used to build his church upon. Pentecost was the start of the church. As Jesus told him, you are Peter, the rock upon which I will build my church. See, the name Peter, if you notice, he used to be called Simon, and Jesus said, from now on, you will be called Peter, back in Matthew. The name Peter translates to rock. So what did Jesus mean when he said, upon you, Peter, Upon this rock, I will build my church. See, he didn't say, upon you, Peter, I build my church, or upon your successors, I build my church. But see, he was introducing that work that was going to be done through Peter to build his church, Christ's church, God's church. 
his work of building the church upon himself. He would use Peter to do that work of building the church. Peter's witnessing to those crowds in Jerusalem was an example of God working within him, sending that Holy Spirit to empower him, gifting him with that boldness, gifting him with that gift of witness. Notice no fear, it was all gone. The fear disappeared. Fear and faith cannot occupy the same space at the same time. So what a powerful work was done that day. And it said about 3,000 were converted that day. Wow. Wouldn't that be great today to be able to reach out and touch the hearts and minds and set free from sin and death 3,000 people today? I'd love it. So as I conclude the day, I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions. How is God using us today? What calling has he made on our lives? Who will he reach by using the gifts that he gives us to use through the Holy Spirit? So are we going to sit back and ponder on these gifts that we've been given? Or are we going to share them for the good of others? Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we ask that you would open up our hearts and open up our minds, open up our ears to hear and our eyes to see the glorious life that you have for us. Open our hearts to accept the urging of the Holy Spirit, to lift up others, to edify them in you and through you, Lord. Help us to be your hands and feet today. Empower us. Send us out boldly to proclaim the good news to those who are literally dying without it. Lord God, we just, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here, whether we're here physically in this building or online, but we are here together in community, in communion with one another, and in that spirit of holiness that you've placed in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. In your precious son, Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Mark. All I can think of is this, you know, as we think about the scriptures where it says, amen, amen, and amen. Just putting a stamp on it and saying, this is what the Lord wants. And as Mark was preaching this morning, I'm thinking of, of just different things of how uh, the, the scriptures bring witnessing alive to us through Jesus. Um, so I, I, the first one I, I went to was Jesus witnessing to the woman at the well. And when he told her what he had for her, that living water, what'd she do? She ran back to the village, she told everybody she could, and they all came out. And then uh, in John chapter 8, a woman comes up to him, and, and, the, and the, the Jewish leaders come up, and they're condemning her for adultery, and he's just down on the ground, kind of drawn on the ground. And, and he says, you who has not sinned, cast the first stone. But all... I can hear in my head are the rocks dropping and hitting the ground. And at the very end of that, he says, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. Mark and I have talked about this many times. The church is a place, not for the saints, but for the sinners, for those who need healing. We're a hospital for those who need a spiritual healing. All are welcome here. And that's why this, this witnessing sermon was so important. That's why this uh, uh, being stronger together back to church Sunday is so much and so important to us. And then I, I just can't get that first slide out of my head where it said the most loving act 
you can ever do for someone is to share the gospel with them. And that's done through many ways, not with brownies that have the different things that you've done wrong. Food sometimes is a great way to share, and we're dying to do another, another meal with everyone. But that takes us to this meal, this very important meal, this meal that reminds us of what Jesus did for us on the cross. That he went to the cross, he was laid out, nailed, and died for our sins once and for all time, regardless of what we've done. Doesn't matter. So it was on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And then later in the meal, he filled the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you. Take and drink. And the scriptures tell us for as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are to do so until the Lord's return. So we would like for you to join us this morning. If you are online and want to join us, please let us know. We'll get some of these cups delivered to you so that you can partake of communion with us. Just simply tear off the top. Cellophane. The body of Christ. The blood of Christ, freely given for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for giving us the example, for being our example of how we can witness to others, and that we do it, we do it in love. And Father, as, as we go from this series and, and take what we've learned. And we head into our next one, Messy, where we're going to talk about how loving others isn't easy. Father, let us use these gifts that you have taught us about in these last eight weeks so that we can love others regardless. Thank you, Father, for this meal and what it represents and that it is a representation of our salvation that we get through your Son, Jesus Christ. service for agape time if there's any prayer requests that you would like to ask or um, any god sightings that you'd like to talk about i'll come around with the microphone and let you talk anybody well i'd like to talk about um what mark had talked about last sunday and i didn't pray for that you talked about a person that you were able to talk to because they came to you and asked um about god and I feel that, you know, through this whole COVID situation, you know, God has a plan. And I feel that um, sometimes it's not our plan. But, you know, during this time, he's bringing people to Christ. And so we are all witnesses to him. And I love the sermon this morning. It all tied in with that, that we are to be witnesses for God. So let's go to God in prayer. And um, Father God, just bring your Holy Spirit into this house into the people's lives that are watching online and, and just um, let them know that they are loved and that we serve a great God. And he is there to help us. He is there to comfort us. And he will always be with us. He will put people in our path so that we may find you. And um, I also want to pray for Mark. Father God, please bless him. Um, Comfort his body and his heart and his mind and his soul today. Put a um, hedge of protection around him and Lori and, and all of us Christians that um, want to spread the good word, Lord Jesus, so that there's no stumbling block in our way. For you are God, and you can do all things. You can heal our bodies, heal our minds and our spirits, and you comfort us as no other can. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
those of you that are online, thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you feel comfortable next week, join us in person at 11 o'clock right here. Otherwise, we'll see you next week online. Thank you.